Well, I'm a plain old Don Brown, I'm class of 67, fabulous class, all brighter than I am. Uh, I live and work in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, it's my family's home for uh, a long time. That's where I practice. I'll try to give you a brief answer. Uh, actually, yes. Uh, as an architect, I get to do lots of things that are enjoyable and fun, projects that add some value, I think, at the moment. Um, at this very table yesterday, we were working with a fabulous group of, uh, of uh, African-American leadership in Montgomery to properly restore uh, the church that Martin Luther King was, was designated, elevated, uh, uh, given a no-choice deal as a young pastor to run the Montgomery Improvement Association, which was the very beginning of the civil rights movement here, predated Rosa Parks, his own parsonage activity, the Selma March, all of that. Uh, it is, uh, it's a real honor to, to, to do this properly. And it's more than just restoring uh, an older church that has warm feelings throughout a very important community here, but it is telling the story properly and a portion of the work involves properly presenting the opportunities to tell a whole variety of people, visitors from everywhere, uh, what role that played uh, in the longer story. So it's not only just architecture, it's breathing life into history uh, accurately with an absolutely wonderful group of people that want to do the right thing. That's an honor. I, I don't know about my personal identity. I, I'm a, I'm a Bit of a farce gump. I've done a variety of things over time, maybe because I can't hold down one job well. But uh, you got to have a little bit of humility, because uh, as all architects understand that you you get lucky to do some work that is pleasurable, and you do a lot of work that you just you have to do. So it's a it's a wonderful profession. But uh, I'm uh, privileged to do uh, some fun work. Uh, we uh, do work in a whole variety of southeastern states. I've just finished a hospital piece in uh, Miami, which is complicated to do uh, a whole variety in Louisiana, just a whole series of states around here. But in Montgomery, we've been privileged to have done some very signature work that uh, has made the city habitable. We've done the bulk of downtown, the master plan for the city, a whole riverfront resurrection. We've been part of the political and community process to describe how that works. Uh, been the luncheon speaker at every uh, Lions Club, Kiwanis, uh, multiple times, every professional association to describe economic redevelopment and what that can really do. And when you ally yourself with really smart business leaders of all sorts, representing all of the community, then many things are possible. And, uh, and so uh, that's, uh, that's been the, uh, the bulk of my, my work, uh, work that I think has some some long-term value. People will forget who did it. They'll remember when they touched it, and that's okay. That's a very humble perspective for something and someone that's had a huge impact. Um, I mean, you gave us a mini tour of all the ways that you've touched this community, and it's really, really impressive to think about how much you've reinvigorated this, this space and still managed to work towards telling its history and building, you know, a strong sense of space for people um and that's just a very small bit of your much bigger story which i wish we had like four hours of time to go over um but thank you for sharing that um and we're we're excited to hear about all of it let me tell you one quick story uh when you uh, and i learned this at williams uh when you learn that everything is possible if you do your homework you read you're smart you communicate with others you run a fast needle like all my classmates did, uh, you raise your game and you figure out how can I get this done. We helped identify uh, the property uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama at Moton Field for a potential project involving the Tuskegee Airmen. We did that pro bono because it was an opportunity to define an area that would have potential to be developed as a park service project. Uh, through several iterations and a few years later, it became the largest park service project in the country. And, uh, and its funding would have been uh, ravaged by other of the 11 districts in the Park Service. I know this is on film, somebody may be one of those, but that's okay. Uh, they're all competing for uh, things that were important in their jurisdictions, but it would have gone away had we not communicated very effectively on a regular basis 
with various individuals in Congress that had authorized that money. We wound up having the privilege, the lifelong privilege, to have the original Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, all of, except one, now are gone. At, at this conference room table on a regular basis for two years to define how to do that, how to rebuild, resurrect, and reconstruct uh, the place where they learned to fly and learn the messages that we wanted to explain to others. Uh, that kind of interaction is a once in a lifetime and uh, it's way cool. Uh, Charles McGee is uh, represented all of the uh, he's 100 now. He got the Congressional Medal. You've seen him on television. He's the most humble and sweet man I think I've ever met uh, and has uh, been part of our family. That's a privilege. Thank you for sharing that. That's really powerful work um, to have partnered with um, and has a huge, huge moment to reflect on within American history. So thank you for your work with that. Um, is This is kind of a surprise question. Um, is there a project that you're most proud of? Would, would you lean towards the Tuskegee project or is there any other one that you like really felt attachment to? I can give you a, an easy answer. Uh, there is a medical project in Montgomery that uh, uh, is one of my very favorite projects, a, a very contemporary project. It is the most energy efficient building in Montgomery. It's got glass and overhangs and it has all the strategies for energy use that are important. It's gotten awards and recognition, but it's uh, it's very it's obviously very different from a preponderance of historic restoration and other work we've done. It's like having children. I like all my children. They look different and have different interests. I like them all. So I can't choose favorites. But when I'm asked about a contemporary building, uh, there's one here that uh, uh, is profoundly the right way to treat uh, a building envelope that's been published and recognized and uh, copied. That's the fun part when something's copied. The question is what community you're referring to. And I have several, uh, like, like many folks. Uh, uh, there's a professional community of which I'm a part. Uh, <clears throat> there is a there is a local political and business community, which not always is the same, but uh, it's the collection of leadership that is uh, that's in churches, in business, in chamber of commerce, in banks, hospitals, schools, uh, and we've always engaged at length with that professional community. Where I've been the longest serving architect on the board of the Chamber of Commerce. I've chaired a variety of committees over time. If you're in the, in the room uh, with that honor, you have an opportunity to change uh, the direction of, uh, of an issue or a solution. So uh, we've been, as an architect, more involved than any in my profession. Uh, here I chair, thanks for my profession in the state of Alabama at some length. Uh, and I've been the longest serving member of the Board of Directors in AIA's history nationally. Uh, it's unusual for somebody from Alabama. I'm, uh, I'm the only architect to ever be given the honor of giving the commencement address for uh, tens of thousands of people at Auburn University. Um, I've uh, in the Construction Hall of Fame in Alabama. I've worked with uh, working issues for the contractor side that are how to resolve issues that people in our profession on a statewide basis and at a national basis. And you, you do that when you simply connect with others and collaborate on how to fix a problem or improve a process or make things better. It's all collaborative and it's just playground. It's not hard. There, there are a couple. Uh, one, the old adage that uh, when you see a turtle on a fence post, uh, you know somebody had to put him there. Well, I've been a turtle. And uh, by overwhelming uh, experience at Williams that was insightful, educational, motivating for the rest of my life has been the triumvirate of Lane Faison, Witt Stoddard, and Bill Pearson. Uh, the three of the art mafia. That was uh, the best in the country. and. Uh, even I'd lived in Europe before I came to Williams and had seen everything we were looking at on screen, having a blue book in two hours to write a critical analysis was, was tasking. And it's informed the rest of my life. 
uh, I couldn't have had a better motivating faculty. And I've taught since and I've worked in the academy in a variety of ways and chaired schools of architecture and done accreditation visits. And I always remember the shadows of the triumvirate, the trio. And uh, that raises your game and makes you think more succinctly and delicately about, about issues of expression that ought to bring joy. So those three are incredibly important. Secondly, uh, I had a lot of fun at Williams. I did things that my parents probably would have rather have had me not do and study instead. Uh, one of the things I did was work at WMS, WCFM, and, and I wound up narrating uh, uh, late night stuff. I did, uh, I narrated the faculty debates, wrote the questions, uh, ran those, I ran our college board a bowl team that uh, wound up killing everybody in national competition on television. And that gave me some skill sets, or at least lack of fear at a microphone. And, and what I've done in my own profession nationally is uh, serve in that same role in a variety of ways, almost in the role that you're playing now with me. But, uh, uh, and I was working with obviously very incredibly bright people that were varietal, that uh, absolutely set the standard for what the room should look like. Uh, uh, with really smart people in there and how, what, how you ought to perform, what you need to take advantage of. And remarkably, people without the Williams opportunity, uh, if you give them the right rope and room uh, and trust, uh, they, can, they can measure up. I got a great start, thankfully. I needed it. I designed good things for people. Uh, that make them happy, or solve a problem, or create a better environment, or uh, produce something of value that will last. I get to produce something. I get to make something. I'm a maker. And that gives me joy. It's my obligation as a person on this planet, and as a parent. Uh, it's easy to say that, uh, but it's it's harder to do it when you have obstacles in front of you to remember what your ultimate goal is. Now, I, I won't last on this planet. We all don't. Uh, I'd like to leave the place uh, better than I found it in little ways. Uh, and so uh, in my own office, the folks that work for me, the other entities that I've worked with, uh, the great joy is is spreading joy among all those people that you collaborate with uh, to get good things done. I'm not a singular person. I don't tend to do things by myself. I'm not good enough to do that. I'm not smart enough to do that. But if I can incentivize, work, cajole, and motivate others, valuable, smart people, uh, like your classmates at Williams and others, people that have varietal abilities, they look different, they act different, have different goals, but if you can Collaborate toward uh, a profoundly worthy objective that, by golly, you can get it done. That's joy. Thank you. I, it's, it's really powerful to have that sense of connection um, and being able to tangibly see your work manifest itself, whether that's in a building, whether that's in seeing someone else feel accomplished and connected, or seeing people just gather at the local ball field is really really powerful, tangible, and meaningful, and I'm sure you get to see that pretty regularly in this community that has many, many touch points from you um, and your staff, and really, you get to be proud of a lot of that work. Even even if you are very, very humble in, in the way you're delivering all this, uh, we've gotten to hear from you about a lot more and how many different ways you've impacted, so thank you for all of that work. told me you were going to ask me that question, and I told you the answer really ought to be. Uh, uh, let me let me just be uh, very direct with that one. Uh, my, my, my wife and best friend of 53 years died three months ago, and uh, I'm in the middle of writing hundreds of thank yous, and a great wealth of those are to... <sighs> Funny you should ask this question. Uh, to, to my dearest friends uh, all over the country, that are professional friends, not just family, but friends that we grew to love and know uh, in a whole variety of ways. They look different. They've been guests at our home. They're from uh, 
walks of life, uh, people that have touched us in, in return. And so the thank you notes uh, need to go to not one, but anyone and everyone every day. Uh, I mean, I had to wait for a time before I could have enough composure to write those thank you notes. But they're uh, not so much a thank you for what they wrote to us about their love for my, my bride, but uh, my note back to them needs to, and what I'm doing now, is to just express my profound love and friendship for what our, our friendship has meant uh, over the years in a variety of ways. Uh, one of them I just got was a close friend of mine who, who lives in Eagle, Colorado, and a dear, dear friend who worked with me collaboratively when we spent three years working on the creation of this country's energy code. Uh, I got credit for being the co-leader of this huge effort. It lasted three years. It has resulted in this country's building code for energy. Uh, I can give you a lecture on climate change that'll last for hours and I can be right. Most people don't know. But the guy that I consider really made that happen is Chris Green in Eagle, Colorado. Who looks different, who has different interests, but uh, dear, dear friend, if he ever needed anything, I'd be on his doorstep as quick as I could drive or fly there. And I know the same thing would be true in reverse. So thank yous are not singular. They're every day. Uh, and it's a privilege. First, I'm really sorry for your loss, um, and thank you for sharing that. That is really, that is a lot to, to share. Um, so we, we appreciate your transparency and openness. Um, second, I think that that notion of thank yous and gratitude and in some ways naming love is, is a really pertinent one, um, especially for us. We had our very first interview that was actually a pretty big theme that came from one of our colleagues who was sharing that, you know, in in lots of these times, particularly trying times, it's important to sort of step back and name that love and appreciation out loud because it goes a long way for both you personally and for the person receiving that, that sense of appreciation. Um, so I wholeheartedly agree and support this notion of thank yous are every day and to everyone. It's a good question. Just remember that as a, as a closing thought, Everything in life is a gift. And those of us that were fortunate enough to go to the Purple Haze, uh, attend classes that started way too early in the snow on a cold winter's morning, had the gift of fabulous classmates, incomparable faculty uh, that gave us every bit of rope and room to, to achieve the best, stretched us incomparably, who set uh, aspirations for all of us as students that have carried through our lives and certainly made an impact on me. And my thought simply is to just continue to do the right thing and don't keep scoring. Do the best you can. Don't ask for feedback. Don't ask for an accolade. Don't ask for a memory because they go short. Do the rest. Do the best you can. Do the right thing and, and don't keep score. Life's a gift. Do what you can while you're here. <laughs>